Okay, so what we are going to be looking at today um, is just our introduction to the PowerPoint unit. What do we always do on that first day of a new unit? So let's all get into our class notebook. Into our team's class notebook. These are the notes that will become your quiz at the end of PowerPoint. So make sure that you are listening carefully. I'm going to specifically tell you guys when you should write things down. That's kind of the style I go with. Um, not that that's the way it is like in college and stuff, but you know what, we're not in college. I want you to be prepared and I want you to get the main ideas. I want you to be prepared and I want you to get the So once you're in the class notebook, make sure you click on the expander over here once it shows. I'm a little laggy. The expander over here once it shows. I'm a little laggy. And find your name. And go into and your name. class notes section. And go into where you're going to see your email notes and your word notes already there. Where you're going to see your email notes and your word We're notes. We're going to add a page. So in this middle column at the bottom, you just click on add page. Add page. So in this middle column at the bottom. And we'll name this Microsoft PowerPoint. And we'll name this Microsoft PowerPoint. A few things just like a look ahead while you guys are kind of preparing your notes sheet here. Um, for this unit, there will be two major projects. One of them is a PowerPoint that you create completely from scratch that needs to be designer quality. Okay, so it's almost like um, designer quality. You're going to look at examples again of what good PowerPoint design looks like, and you're going to recreate that from a blank presentation. Okay, and the topic for that one, it's a more personal thing. It's not going to be presented in front of the class. The second big project is selecting a topic of your choice that you already feel like you know stuff about. Okay, this topic could be something that like maybe you need to like look up some stats or do some research for, or it could even just be telling the story of like your family's tradition, something that you do together regularly. Um, the whole point of that presentation, because it is something that you're going to give orally in front of the class, is that I want you to feel comfortable and not nervous about talking about this stuff so that doesn't get in the way. Okay, a small part of the grade for that PowerPoint is the actual presentation quality. The major part of your grade is the actual PowerPoint, because that's what this class is all about, right? Okay, so those are the two types of things we're going to be working on. And again, there will be a bunch of modules to help us kind of learn the tools and things inside the program. Okay, so we're all here in our notes. Um, there's a document that I posted today inside the files, you do not need to open it now. I'm going to show you. Inside the files of your team, there's a PDF called A Non-Designer's Guide to Creating Memorable Visual Slides. This is pretty much a textbook for a class that I took um, through like a Microsoft write-off called Visiting. And um, they let me like download the, the whole textbook, so now I share it probably illegally for all of my students. But it's okay, right? We're not like making money off of this. But there's so much in this document. It's like a textbook. You see, it has 125 pages. Today, for your notes, I'm going to walk you through page numbers and different things that I think you should write down that will be useful for you when you're creating PowerPoints, but also useful for you on your quiz. Okay, so you have this document that I'm sharing with you today for reference again later, but please take the notes that I'm asking you to write down. Are we ready? I'd like you guys to write down is on page six. Okay, I'm going to read part of this. Don't worry about writing all of this down. For most people, and this is nobody's fault, but for most people, using presentation software like PowerPoint or Google Slides to create slide decks has become second nature. You simply just choose a design template, 
you insert your text and create bullet points for each of the slides, maybe a few images here and there, and you're done. No, not if you want to impress your audience. Okay, the most effective speakers have learned to wean themselves off of bullet-ridden slides in favor of highly visual presentations that reinforce the words instead of repeating them. Have you guys ever watched a, a speaker who has a PowerPoint and they're like staring at it? And I mean like a speaker in a class, like maybe you have a presentation in history and like somebody had to make a PowerPoint and they're just like reading and staring at the screen. That's clearly not what like professionals do. Okay, but this comes as no surprise. Since human beings are hardwired to process images quicker than textual information in fast 13 milliseconds according to one of the latest studies. Um, however, most students, academics, and business people are taught to stick to that old-fashioned presentation full of text-heavy slides. Makes it harder for people to understand and remember what you're talking about. Okay, so in your notes, can you please write down um, highly visual presentation? Highly visual presentation. This is our main focus throughout this entire unit. This is our main focus throughout this entire unit. Now when you hear like highly visual, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a slide with like 20 pictures on it. It doesn't necessarily mean What it means is that the image that you share or images that you share are something that connects your audience to the topic. Okay, like let's look at this scientific research here on this slide. There's a difference here between visual learners auditory learners and experiential learners. Okay, the visual learners are the people who will remember things and grasp concepts by seeing things. 65% of the general population identifies as a visual learner. How many of you think that you're visual learners? How many of you think that you're visual learners? I mean, like, I can see that. I'll identify things. I'll even I remember learning how to spell by picturing what that word looks like on the page in a book. Like, and I would always tell my kids that, like, when you're getting stuck, like, pretend you're reading a book in your mind and can you see that word on a page to help you kind of guide through the spelling. Um, remembering different images that appear on pages in a textbook, even where they land on a page, can sometimes help people remember the actual definition. Okay, 30% of our population in general consider themselves auditory learners. They learn by listening. How many of y'all are auditory learners? Okay, even though I connect with the visual learner thing, I think I identify as an auditory learner. Okay, when I went to college after a couple different attempts at majors, I became an English major. And one thing that I didn't realize was um, when you're an English major, you're probably reading about 15 novels, different novels in the course of like two weeks. Guess who was not sitting in her dorm room reading constantly? Miss Knox. But I would go to these classes and I would listen to like everybody else talk about what they read and I would take my notes. And from just hearing other people talk about the book, I learned about it. Okay, hearing the professor talk about these like big ideas helped me learn about the book without actually looking at it. Okay, so I think actually even like listening to podcasts, things sink in for me better that way. Okay, but then there are the 5% of you who are experiential learners. These are the people who like will not understand a thing in chemistry class until you're doing a lab. Okay. Or the people who are really drawn to like the STEM program where you're building and creating and being hands-on makes stuff work for you better. Um, also the type of people who usually like to not read instructions. Like you ever get a piece of IKEA furniture and you just open it up and you think you're going to get after it without reading the instructions? That's your experiential learner. Any of you experiential? Okay, very cool. I think that that's like more of a thing now. In this day and age than it was when I was a kid. We didn't have opportunities like that. Like we sat in the classroom and you just had to stare at the teacher. All right, pretty interesting. So when we are 
making PowerPoints, right, just right, like right, we right, had in our right, essential right, questions right, for right, Word, we're considering our audience. Just like Okay, most of our audience is a visual, having a visual learning experience. So our slides should represent that. Okay, the next thing I want to talk to you guys is on page eight. So in your notes, I would write down page eight. The next thing I want to talk to you guys is on page eight. So in your notes, I would write down page eight. And this is one of your quiz questions as well. There are actually what they call three legs to a good quality presentation. Three legs. And the three legs are content, and the three visual legs design, are content, and delivery. Visual design and delivery. A good presentation that they're talking about here, they're qualifying something being like, you know, high quality, memorable, effective. You have to do all three of these things or take into consideration all three of these things in order for your audience to connect and remember. Content, clearly, that's like the information. Sometimes you're forced to sit through presentations that are not a topic that you would choose on your own. But as long as that content is, um, how can I say it? Like interesting, is giving you something new, that's very important. Okay, some visual design. A slideshow that's just a bunch of bullet points with full sentences. You're going to, first of all, not even be paying attention to the speaker. You kind of just look at the, the sentences. Okay, but if you have something that maybe has animations that are used appropriately, or images that you can connect to what the speaker is talking about, you're good to go. And then finally, delivery. Delivery is like that speech side to it. As a speaker, are you engaging with your audience? Are you making eye contact? Do you change the way your voice sounds in different parts of your speech? We're going to watch a video of a, a professional speaker who trains people on giving presentations next week, and he talks a lot about delivery and why that's so important. Okay, so the three legs of a good presentation are content, visual di design, and delivery. The next note is on page 10 of this wonderful textbook. The next note is on page 10 of this wonderful textbook. And it's the first sentence, which is a little difficult to read up here. Can I zoom in? And it's the first sentence, which is a little difficult to read up here. Can I zoom in? Okay, right up here. Um, the three, no, I'm sorry, the four. Okay, right up here. Um, the three main ways the to four. present, or the four purposes main ways for presentation present. are to inform. Purposes. For presentation. Entertain, inform, inspire, entertain, and persuade. Inspire and persuade. Think about speakers. And when I say speakers, oh hi, thank you. Think about speakers. those are for um fourth period. When I say speakers. Yeah, thank you. Those are for um fourth period. Um, I I could be talking about just a teacher, a professor, um, I, um a I could be pastor during the homily at mass. Or like a legit like life coach, like Tony Robbins, who gets on the stage in front of thousands of people in a huge stadium to give a presentation. Okay, but these are the four main purposes. Inform. Pretty self-explanatory. You're just kind of spitting out information like I am today. To entertain. Um, who would be an entertaining presenter? To entertain. Um, who would be an entertaining presenter? Their purpose is to entertain. Yeah, like stand-up comedians. Sometimes you can get people who are really talented and can kind of cross-section here that inform and entertain. Really and, and while they're giving you information, they make it kind of fun. And while they're giving inspirational purpose to inspire. Where do you get that? Purpose to inspire. Where do you get that? So I think anybody who gives, and it's mostly like celebrities and professional athletes who give those like life story, self-help type of speeches, those are inspirational. But man, I would call like Father Murphy and Father Rich's homilies inspirational sometimes too, right? And then finally to persuade. And a persuasive speech is what we see politicians use. 
right, when they're um, campaigning. It's even just as simple as watching an ad. That's a persuasive presentation. What is the weird ad that's all over the place now? What is the where it's like the cartoon, the 3D cartoon people, and they're like dancing? Do you know what I'm talking about? My people would go crazy. Yes, it's Grubhub. Isn't it like embarrassing? It's all over the place. Yes, it's Grubhub. It's Grubhub. Like, like, they make food. It's all yeah. over the place. All right, let's move Grubhub. down to page 22. Yeah. All right, let's move down to yeah, page 22. Yeah, Inform, entertain, inspire, persuade. Inspire. Okay, um, what am I going to talk about here? Okay, so you could just write down in your notes this heading. Create okay, visual so slides, not document. This heading. Create visual slides, not document. When we make our projects in here, our PowerPoint presentation, when we make if you're giving me a slide with a bunch of bullet points or a paragraph on it, you are setting the bar at, like you're starting at a C plus for your grade. It is not allowed in this class, okay? If other teachers in different classes have that as part of their product description or their expectations or instruction, that's fine. But we're not in other classes, okay? We're taking a different stance with PowerPoint. We need to create visual slides, not documents. It shouldn't be something that like um, you're gonna print out and hand out to people so that they can study information. Your slideshow is going to be like a show. Your slideshow is going to be like with that in mind. Um, this is something that will be on your quiz. When using text on a slide, you should never use a font smaller than size 30. So the minimum size for slide font, page 23 in our textbook, is a size 30 font. And it's much easier for people in the classroom right now to see, like on this slide up here that I'm showing you, this is what 30 looks like. I mean, I think that's too small, even. What if this was a bigger room? I think it would be hard to read in the back of a gymnasium as opposed to being inside a small classroom. This is what a size 120 font looks like. This is what a size 120 When you're creating a slideshow and you have to get to like size 120, I think you have to manually enter that. It's not even like on the, the scroll bar anymore because it seems a little excessive. But when you're looking at it on a, pre a presentation screen, that looks totally appropriate. So a size 120 font looks great. Okay, this next slide is also part of your quiz. And on your quiz, you're going to see these exact images from this current page in this textbook. So why don't you write down page 24 and the heading, which it looks like it says leading, but it's actually pronounced in this case, letting. Letting. This is very important when you're including text on the slide. Now, A, I don't like any of these slides. I feel like they're too text heavy. But I don't mind it so much because they used kind of a graphic to separate these pieces of information. Makes it a little bit more appealing as opposed to just having bullet points across the slide. Okay, but what is letting? Letting is defined as the amount of space between lines. The amount of space between lines of text, to be specific. This is a quiz question. Letting is the amount of space between text. Let's take a look at these a little bit. Okay, this first example. Yep, this one. Okay, so this slide here, as it says underneath, okay, has so too here, little letting, meaning like there's not enough space between the lines of text. Meaning like there's not enough 
it mostly kind of is you know demonstrated in the center bullet point here see how kind of cramped the lines of text look when you're sitting far away from a screen that's very difficult to read so this is what too little lighting looks like where there's cramped lines of text how about this one this is too much letting there's almost so much space in between each line separating these sentences that it looks like there are six separate points being made here when it's really just three but there's too much letting too much space between these lines of text it makes it hard for people to grasp the information down here is what they consider to be the just right letting the spacing between the lines of text within the sentence is appropriate and then the space in between each point also makes for good flow and your eyes can follow it easily letting is the amount of space between lines of text okay the next page i want to show you guys is page 25 i don't know how i ended up all the way down here Page 25, and this is about fonts, and there are two main categories of fonts. If I was at my keyboard, I could just put in the number 25 down here, but far away. So yeah, you're going to have some text on your slide. You have to, right? So, yeah, there are two main text. types of text. You have to, right? One is there called sans serif font. One is called you see this word right here? Let me see if I can blow this up. Font. You see this word right here? Let me see sans serif. Do you guys know that the word sans, sans means without? Serif. Do you guys know that the word so that sans is, means without? It's like essentially saying without so serif. It's like essentially saying without serif. Somebody said, like, I just ran outside into the snow sans shoes. Said, like, it means like they went out without shoes because they're crazy. Sans shoes. It means like they went out without shoes because they're crazy. Sans serif means without serif. So what does the, the other type of font is sans just called a serif font, serif font so without the, the word sans. Font is just called a so one serif identifier is sans serif and the other is plain old so serif. One identifier is sans serif and the other is plain old serif. An example of a serif okay, so, font um, an example of would a be serif something like Times New Roman. Would be serif like is Times, Times New Roman. Write that in your notes. Serif is Times New Roman. Write that in your notes. A sans serif example a is Arial or Calibri. That default for us. Is Arial in Microsoft Word. So here on this slide, once it catches up with me, so so I'm going to see this list of fonts. This top example, Rubik, this top is a, example, did I tell you guys sans serif was Times New Roman? Did I tell you guys no, I said sans serif is Arial or Calibri, right? Yeah. So I want to make sure I'm not. Okay, so this top 
a Rubik example is sans serif. So this top, a Rubik example. And this Playfair dis display is serif. You notice what's different between Rubik and Playfair display. Between Rubik and Playfair display. Yes, Mira. The lines in Rubik are like all the Okay, so the key thing to what you said that I want you guys to notice is that extends past the letter piece. Like, do you notice here even in uh, cormorant how there's kind of little like hooks on the ends of some of the letters? In Times New Roman, you know how there are little like teeth or hooks on the ends of each of the letters? That's called serif. Those hooks on the letters are called serif. So if you see something like Rubik or Calibri, your default, that doesn't have those little teeth or hooks, that's without serif, right? Sans serif. Something to write into your notes. Serif fonts are more appropriate for published printed materials. Serif fonts are appropriate for published and printed materials. Sans serif is what is like professionally accepted in anything digital. Sans serif is for things digital. So interesting story. Okay, like if you're reading an actual novel, hard cover book. And you look through the font, generally, most of the time, most of the time, you're going to see a serif font. Like it's more like a Times New Roman look. You're going to see a serif font. Like it's more like a Times New Roman look. You're almost always going to see a sans serif, more black page, you're almost always going to see a sans serif, more black They did like research on people's, you know, their readability of documents. And they found out that digitally, when you're reading off of a screen, it's easier for the eyes and therefore easier to grasp information when you have a sans serif font. When I was in college, the Microsoft Word default font was Times New Roman. Because you used Microsoft Word to write essays and print them and give them to teachers, right? You guys don't have to, well, I know some teachers here make you print. Noobs. But mostly you don't have to print anymore, right? Everything's digital. But How, you don't have like, what a coincidence right? that now Microsoft Word's How, default like, font is a sans serif font. Okay, they understand what we use their word processor for okay. nowadays and have made changes. Okay, so moving down through this textbook, um, they start to give you guys a bunch of samples of slides. So in your notes, can you just put page 32 sample slides? I just want you to note that because when you start to make your presentations, instead of like Googling good slideshow examples, I want you to come back to this reference material here, this textbook. And starting on page 32, they start to show you some really cool looking slide setup. When you guys give your speech on Michael Jordan, your family's Christmas Eve tradition, um, dance, tradition, soccer, um, cooking, dance, whatever you pick is your topic, which soccer, could be anything. Cooking, your slides are going to look more like this instead of just having a title at a top at the top with bullet points. Hideous, right? But all of these pages are giving you some just really cool, inspiring ideas on how to design slides so that they're more effective in presenting. Okay, there are things on here like that show you the before and after. Okay, there are things on here like Granted, in my opinion, there's way too much text on this slide if you were presenting a lot. Okay, if this was something that you were having people read individually on their own, that's all right. But look at the difference. Having a slide where it's the old-fashioned title, information, and a boxed image just plops on there. Amateur hour, look what you could do. Like, why don't we make that image the entire background of the slide? And now it's more visually entertaining. 
and you're still given the same information. Here's another example where people just put a title, the info, and a boxed image. Gross. Let's set up like this. Make that image a whole half of your slide, and now it, it's not only there for a reference, it's part of the design. Okay, they give you some real um, technical points in here, but this is another thing I love. Like, this is the difference that between A's and B's on the real estate flyer. Just having your pictures kind of scattered around or turning them into a, a sensical graphic with some kind of grid design. Very cool look. Um, they talk here about using your knowledge of the cropping tool. I'm giving a presentation on metalworking. I can show this small box picture of the guy doing the work, or I could even crop the person kind of out of it and showcase the actual work being done, make it a whole half of the slide. It's a lot cooler. Here's another crop. I have this whole like scenery here with the, the tiger, but I mean, the, the picture cropped out without all this kind of dirty grass and stuff. It just is a much more appealing image. Um, these are more like title or not, yeah, title slides, like the opening slide in a presentation, how you can create different backgrounds. All of these types of background images can be Googled. Same with these. How cool is this? You can um, use your artistic effects in PowerPoint to make your images look kind of foggy. Your slides will look more like those, okay? That's what we're going for. And you have tons and tons of examples. Ditch the bullet points. Words to live by. Um, okay, page 49. Oh, I already showed you that. Um, finally, the last thing for your notes on page 73. This textbook gets super like graphic designy and talks about selecting color palettes and things that make sense and what people are drawn to, yada, yada, yada. Um, the last thing for your notes is inserting video. So add uh, page 74. Or is that 73? I can't read. Inserting video. Um, your video that you put into a slide, which you will include on your final project, should be between 30 and 60 seconds long. An effective presentation will have a video clip between 30 and 60 seconds long. I keep saying it, but it's it's true. Like. People's jobs is to study like psychology of human understanding and whatever. And they find out that if you're presenting something and you show a video clip that's less than 30 seconds, people aren't going to remember it as much because it takes your brain 30 seconds to actually commit to what you're looking at and then absorb the information. So 30 seconds is the minimum. That's the amount of time it takes the brain to commit and then absorb. Anything over a minute is overkill. People lose interest, start looking at other things, get distracted. So this will be an expectation on your project as well as a quiz question. Video should be between 30 and 60 seconds long. All right, the last few pages of the textbook talk about just more um, delivery points and stuff. Um, something cool that I failed to show you guys at the very beginning. It points out in this textbook that like when you're giving a presentation, it's like telling a story. Okay, there are different ways like in a plot diagram that you can tell a story. It could be chronological. It could be um, where you start with like a teaser of what the ending is at the beginning and then go back and tell the build up. Okay, when you're giving a presentation, we'll think about those things. Do you have any questions about this textbook? The notes that you just took. Again, this is inside your um, files tab. It's called a non-designer's guide to creating memorable visual slides. Okay, so let's go into our assignment. Okay, so for today, I posted three modules in PowerPoint. 
by now, I am hopeful that you know how to open these assignments, go through the steps of saving them in the desktop app, finding the web page for the tutorial, and then completing the challenge activity. But let me just for the sake of people who might have forgotten, show you how this works. Let's all go into our assignment here called Slide Basic. Let's all go into our assignment here called Slide Basic. When you get into Slide Basics, I put the steps here of how we should open this and go about it. Okay, so this attached practice document, you need to open it in the PowerPoint desktop app. So again, we'll click on the three dots and select to open it in PowerPoint, not online. Open in PowerPoint and it should automatically jump out into the desktop app for you. The first two modules that I posted today use this same practice document, but I posted it in each assignment so you could resave it or save a copy as indicated in the instructions. Okay, so here's our practice document. I'm going to go to File, Save a Copy, Click the Cloud so it goes to your OneDrive, and make this your last name, SB21. SB standing for Slide Basics. If you fail to name it SB21, I'm not going to be able to download it and grade it. Once you've saved it and it changes the name on the top, we're going to go back into our assignment and we're going to open the web page link and watch the tutorial. I click on the link and it should pop me right into my browser. Does anybody else have any slow connection today? Yeah. Not really. Yeah. Well, you can speed it. Uh, speed your connection. I can say that for sure. Okay. So I know that you guys have used PowerPoint before, okay, or some so form of PowerPoint, be it um, Google Slides, Prezi, something. I want you to watch the actual video before you do the challenge activity. I want you to watch the actual. 99% of the time that I get questions from students about the module challenge activity is because they didn't watch the video because it shows you exactly how to do all of those things in the challenge during the video. Okay? So you'll watch that and don't forget when you're done, all of this text that's directly below is mostly just a repeat of what was done by the person in the video. So we scroll all the way until we come to the part that says challenge. And that is when I start making changes to my PowerPoint. I don't make the changes in the video or in those steps right under the video. The changes I make on my homework assignment begin at this challenge heading. Of course, we'll skip over the first one where it says open the presentation because we already did that. Okay, then it starts to ask you to complete these different steps. Okay, then it starts to, to edit the presentation. Steps. Although it is saving it automatically for you, I always suggest Although that you manually save before you turn it in and add your work, you just in case. Um, but there are three modules posted today, and they're all due um, by tonight at 11.59 p.m. At 11 p.m. You guys have about 25 minutes to get working on these. These are the preliminary assignments for PowerPoint. You'll probably be done in 20 minutes with all three. Okay, so the rest of today's period is to um, focus on these three modules, get as many done and turned in as you can so that they're not homework because they are due by tonight at 11.59. Any questions? Thank you so much for listening today with those notes. That stuff's helpful for you. I'm going to right now post inside our team the tab for our um, PowerPoint Quizlet. You're not having a quiz or a test on PowerPoint for a number of weeks, but I like to have it on the first day. It's there for you, okay? All right, get to work, and please let me know if you have any questions.